The subject is individualism and collectivism and spirituality will come in the end. I was an anarchist in the heart. I'm going to do it my way and I'm a very strong individualist. But then looking at the subject, I actually have learned a few more things about myself which I want to share with you. So, some people outside have asked me what you're going to talk about. So I said collectivism and individualism. So, the responses I got were, were uh, collectivism, hmm. so you want to talk about communism? <laughs> Suddenly I realized that the word collectivism has some kind of negative connotations. And some other people told me, I'm actually preferring individualism. So let's look at the subject a little bit and see what we can do with it. So, uh, graphically, we look at it as individualism as we look inwards, collectivism as we look outwards. Uh, so in collectivism, the emphasis is on the collective that we are belonging to. Uh, the group is more important than ritual, and uh, individ in individualism, the happiness is associated with the personal achievement as well as personal egoism uh, in individualist culture. Now, European American culture associates happiness with personal achievement. And happiness is determined, determined by high level of personal egoism. Meanwhile, East Asian cultures see happiness in the relation of interpersonal relationship and cohesion and is determined by personal ego dependence on social relations. Now, the word egoism, another word that has negative connotations, uh, I want to remind you an interesting sentence that we all know, love thy neighbor like you love yourself, which means, and you can give to the other what you have within yourself. So, the word egoism is not necessarily a negative thing if you look at it that way. So, for example, my dear, I love you. <laughs> so, even love is something egoistic, because if I love you, I expect you to love me back. Unless I'm a masochist, Okay? And I love you because I want you to hate me. So, please uh, forgive me, I also like to simplify everything because my aim in the transpersonal is to reach a wider audience as possible. <coughs> so, now. <laughs> So it's an old place. Forget about it. Okay? I've done it because of my insecurities. I start to look at okay. So individualism in Western idea, in my opinion, is a cultural phenomenon that exists that do not exist outside Western world collectivism. In my interpretation, okay, that the Eastern uh, the Eastern study is that in the East, people live in communities. And it's an essential part of their tradition and religion to be a part of a community. Uh, and one of the uh, examples that I want to bring is uh, the people of Tajik Tajikistan. Uh, and because we are being exposed to uh, humanity in transition and different uh, cultural phenomena start, start invading other uh, societies. So in Tajikistan, individualism is a new phenomenon that is not very accepted by Tajik society. 
Uh, Tajiks usually live together in communities. Uh, traditional uh, institution played and uh, still play an important role in the Tajik society. Uh, living together for the Tajiks is their own way of life. According to the Tajik tradition, to be a human or to have status humanity, person has to serve for his society. It has to prove that he is the one member of his community and he must follow religious rituals, common traditions and morality. The Tajiks have such saying from the Persian uh, uh, literature. So, when we are actually talking about shamanism and different uh, ethnic cultures, we are actually talking about the way, the communal way of life when we actually serve each other. And in my opinion, okay, if we talk about ethica, Magda, yeah, when we talk about ethica, it is so important for us to look at the ancient society and the traditional societies and see what we can learn from them. Because it seems to me that some of the individualists call those society as primitive society. So, from a very simple way, if we look at uh, the concept of the conscious and unconscious in Freudian theory and Jungian theory, because for me, Jung, in a way, without knowing it, was, in my opinion, the father of the transpersonal. So, from the Freudian point of view, the conscious mind, uh, the mind is like an iceberg, the conscious is the part that is above uh, the sea level, and the big unconscious is um, underwater. So it means the unconscious is bigger than the conscious mind. But when you're talking about the collective unconscious, and we have here the word collective again, it says that all icebergs are actually are emerged in the same sea. So this is what makes our consciousness, the unconsciousness, consciousness makes it collective. <coughs> it's what we share between us. Another thing I want to say is about science. Uh, some of you that know me, I, as I like to be a little bit uh, controversial, uh, and uh, one of my friends here calls me L'Enfant Terrible de Yorotas. So, it's just a provocation, but I'm in a, uh, I'm in a way of, um, my mind is in trans transition to change a little bit, to adapt, uh, which is not easy for somebody like me. But what is the meaning of the word psychology? Psychology is the science of the mind. Where is the mind? What is the mind? So are we actually practicing the science of some we don't know where it is or what it is? So I'm, with, I'm start, starting my PhD soon in psychology, which means I need to do scientific research. Okay? But uh, what science has done in a way, we created to understand the world around us, we created small boxes. And everything that you can weigh and measure, we put in different boxes and we put a label on it. And what we could not weigh and measure, we threw it out from the window and called it pseudoscience and esoteric. <laughs> so, science in a way look at the difference that are between things. It's science about comparing. What I suggest, let's look at science in a little bit different way. Let's look at science in a collective way. Let's see what we have in common. Instead of focusing what are the differences between us. I read somewhere that men have bigger brains than women. Yeah, there is a research like it, I'm sorry. Use that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's difficult when you women take over. 
intérim. So, for me, collectivism is to see what we have in common and what is our common goal. Uh, Abraham Maslow, another transpersonal person, in my opinion, was actually the first theorist that have uh, created the humanistic movement and the transpersonal movement at the same time. He's the father of two theoretical uh, theories. And he talked about self-actualization. So the interesting thing is that when we read the uh, characteristic of self-actualizers, we see also the importance of individual self actualizers are free from reliance on external authorities or other people. Uh, so in a way, to create something new, we need to be non-conformist. And somewhere I read that Maslow also said once, that whenever something new is emerging, something old, old is trying to pull it back. And in Eurotas, we have this issue about trying to belong to the European Association of uh, Psychotherapy. And because we are called esoteric and pseudoscience and religious people, uh, we are, they trying to block us. Uh, so, it's trying to belong, but also trying to be free from any external authorities. <coughs> Self-actualizers are resourceful and independent. They are comfortable with solitude. But on the other hand, they satisfy the relationship. Self-actualizers also have a different way to relate to others. They have a need for privacy and they are comfortable of being alone. First, they had a need for private, okay. They were relatively independent of culture and environment. <coughs> Relying instead on their own experience and judgment. Okay. Now, this is uh, something that Osho has written, which is actually very interesting for me. The capacity to be alone <coughs> is the capacity to love. It may look paradoxical to you, but it's not. But it's not. It has existential truth. Only those people who are capable of being alone are capable of love. Sharing of going into the deepest core of the other person without possessing the other, without becoming dependent on the other, without reducing the other to a thing, and without becoming addicted to the other. They allow the other, absolute, they allow the other an absolute freedom because they know that, they are, that if the other lives, they will be as happy as they are now. Their happiness cannot be taken by the other because it is not given by the other. So, once again, my dear, I'm sorry, I'm just falling in love, okay? <laughs> so. As we are falling in love, I'm going to tell you a very nice sentence. You make me happy. Okay? Are you happy? You make me happy. Now, when you make me happy, what I'm actually saying, that my happiness depends on your presence in my life. So then we get married, we produce two children, and this is what happens next. You may be unhappy. <laughs> okay. Donald Winnicott, in his article of uh, is in the article of the capacity of being alone, uh, is saying that. The capacity to be alone is not necessary with and loneliness. 
it is internalization of a non-intrusive background present in the mother figure. So, what he also saying that when the baby is just being allowed to lay back and float, and the opportunity that the baby has to experience separation without separation, to be able to lie and float. So, uh, you know, one of the reasons that we therapists are in business is because we have or had mothers. I want to thank all the mothers in the world for keeping us in business. So, I had a mother too, and one of the sentences that my mother loved to say is, don't just sit there and do nothing. Do something with yourself. So, whenever I sit and do nothing, okay, my mother is not with us anymore, but she's still sitting on my shoulder, making me feel guilty that I'm too lazy and I'm doing nothing, and I ought to be doing something. Uh, another thing that Winnicott was actually saying is about holding the therapeutic space, to hold the space. And client comes to me, they pay me money, and I feel like I need to do something for them, or do something to them. <coughs> I'm still working on it, okay? Life is a hard work. I'm still working on it to be able to step back and just hold the space in which the client is drawn. <coughs> so, uh, collectivism. You see, each thing has uh, a positive and negative side. Because everything is dual for the non-dual people in this room. We <laughs> uh, could talk also about the false self. Uh, this is about uh, people who are trying to fit into what other people think and how other people behave and what is socially acceptable and socially not acceptable. That they comply with all the rules and regulations around them. Uh, so, in Winnicott's opinion, this might be create an extreme schizophrenia when the person is actually uh, separated from themselves. So here, is, this is our need for individualism to find who we are. <coughs> okay, the Gestalt prayer. <coughs> you probably know it, but let me read it because it's important. I do my thing and do you and you do yours. I'm not in this world to live up to your expectations, and you are not in this world to live up to mine. You are you, and I am I. And if by any chance we find each other, it's beautiful. If not, we can't be happy. <laughs> so, I'm standing in my transpersonal school, and I'm teaching Gestalt therapy, and I give the students this handout. And one woman gets very, very excited. Oh, this is fantastic. It changed my life. Now I'm just understanding something. A few hours later, my phone rings. Her husband on the phone. <laughs> Why you given this paper to my wife? <laughs> what does it mean she is not here to live to my expectations? <laughs> she is my wife, isn't she? <laughs> so in a way, let's look how we actually trying to possess things, and we imposing a collective. Now, Eric Erikson. Eric Erikson was also very much interested in anthrop anthropology. And he went, actually, to visit a great American Indian tribe, uh, which is called the Oglala Lakota. And in this tribe, according to the Asian tradition, Okay, 
you know, those primitives like to be uh, live in a collective uh, setup. Uh, when a young person reached the age of maturity, he was sent <coughs> to the forest uh, to spend a few days alone and to get a dream, to have a vision. And when he had a vision, he came back, he came back to the tribe, conveyed his vision to the elders of the tribe, and the elders had actually interpreted his dream, and according to the dream that he had, he was assigned a role in the tribe. But then came the Western civilized uh, culture. And what they've done, first of all, they put those Indians in uh, uh, Yeah, okay. And the children they were taken to be educated in the white schools. And because in the Western culture, prosperity comes with education. So they were sent to a boarding school. And what they learned in the boarding school contradicted totally what they, uh, the uh, values of the community they came from. So they've learned the standards of cleanliness and beauty, which contradicted the original uh, standards of modesty. They were taught to compete which contradicted, contradicted the Lakota tradition of being equal. We are living in a civilization of competition. Uh, they were told up to speak up. When they are breathing, they were told to be still. This same thing happened in Australia with the Aboriginal people. That were actually the children were taken into West, white uh, civilized Western schools and were trying to be, they tried to impose on them values that were not part of their uh, original uh, belief. Okay. Herbert Hoover. Now let's, let's go to the United States of America. Our individualism is rooted in our every, very nature. It is based on convictions born of experience. Equal opportunity, the demand for a fair chance, became the formula of the American individualism because it is the method of the American achievement. Okay, sound nice. <laughs> Sorry for that. I apologize. Don't get upset, I don't know where it's coming from. But if you want to see individualism, you can see it here. <laughs> okay. Then, in this nice, civilized, enlightened democracy of the Western world, which is called United States of America, we've got something called this Second Amendment. I am an American. I have the right to bear arms. Your <laughs> approval is not required. So, it doesn't matter that from time to time we have a white American who is taking a weapon and shoots other Americans and then they talk that the uh, immigrants are actually are those and the terrorists and the Muslims are actually those who are killing everybody. But it seems that in the United States of America more white people are actually shot by white people. But, Second Amendment, individualism, we have the right. On the other hand, Mahatma Gandhi says, the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in the service of others. So, we have here the Maslow, uh, uh, Maslow Pyramid as my friend John Rowan, who has passed away, said that Maslow never created a pyramid, but its editors who actually created it. So, 
In the non-integral part, we actually step by step by, step, by focusing on our self-interest, because this is the start, okay? We're going from the basic physiological needs all the way up to self-actualization. But if we look somewhere there in the middle, okay? There is the stage of belonging and social activity. What is belonging? Belonging is being part of a group. A relationship is also in a way a collective. And then, on the transpersonal level, because when Maslow was asked what happens after self-actualization, one of the things that he said, and this is when actually we start to move to the transpersonal, after self-actualization, what we need to do is to help others to self-actualize. And in my opinion, this is why we are here, to help others to self-actualize. This is Barrett uh, Human Motivation, and it actually comes from, uh, based on a uh, Maslow idea, that if we move uh, from the bottom up, so first of all, the baby tries to survive, he creates relationship with his parents and his peers, he acquires his self-esteem, and then mentally starts transforming. But it does, it does not have to stop there, because the question is what to do with it. So then on the spiritual level, there's the internal cohesion. I start to make a difference, and finally, I'm in service. I'm in service of humanity. The most important thing in my personal individualistic view of the transpersonal is that what we need to do is we need to go through three stages. First, we have the experience. Then, after the experience, we need to know how to integrate the experience. What does it mean to me? Okay, I walk on the rainbow, I saw my guru, my angel says, said Ad hi to me. Okay, brilliant. What does it mean to me? What does it mean to me when I saw a golden eagle flying in the sky? What this golden eagle wanted to say to me? And once I've integrated it, exactly as Bernadette said this morning, what are we going to do with it? What are we going to do starting tomorrow morning that will make a difference, not only in our life, but in the life of, of others? So we are in service. And it has to start by help yourself and help others. <coughs> so, what is spirituality for me? Is respecting individuality and celebrating mutuality. Now, so why I joined Eurotas? I needed to belong somewhere. So I'm going to make an assumption, I might be wrong. So approach me in the break and tell me how wrong I am. But in my opinion, I might be wrong. The reason we are all sitting here in this room is because somewhere during our life, we got some kind of a spiritual crisis and identity crisis. And we start to ask the question, who am I and why I'm here? So, in the individual, in individualism, we don't have to ask this question. I'm an engineer, I've got a job, I'm a computer programmer, I'm doing fine. Uh, so, if I look at, collectively, at the client and effort therapy, uh, which actually the age become younger and younger, but for there was time that most of my clients were women uh, after the age of 45. Children left home, nobody needs me anymore, and I went into a crisis. Who am I? I'm not needed. What do I do now? Uh, because of uh, capitalism, 
and individualism, I start to get more and more many therapy because I am a computer programmer, I make a lot of money. When I cross 40, my boss calls me to the office and says to me, thank you very much, your services are not needed anymore, we pay you too much money, you can go home, and then we take two school leavers, we pay them half of what we pay you, and this man goes home, gets into depression, sits by the computer, plays computer games, his wife is still working, earning much more than him. We are in a humanity in crisis. One of the things that I really love about Eurotas is that we, as I see, we are respecting individuality and we are uh, celebrating a mutuality. From time to time I hear somebody saying to me, what you're saying is not transpersonal. I suggest that we don't do a narrow definition of what transpersonal is. Maybe we can actually encompass that nearly everything is in a way transpersonal. Because the moment we make a definition, we do what Freud has done. He done a very strict definition, and then he start to then people start to leave this psychoanalytic society in Vienna because they were disagreeing with him. So when I sit with my colleagues here in private discussions, the most beautiful thing for me is that we have all of us a different view of what is the transpersonal, and we actually respect those differences. So, for me, once again, spirituality means for me respecting individuality and celebrating our mutuality. <coughs> we are a collective, if you want it or not. We are a collective, and what we have in common, I hope, is to help humanity to become a better place when the humanity is in transition. In transition. We do it, we're doing it on a global uh, global uh, uh, collective level, but we're also doing it on individual level. Because the question is, what kind of world we want to leave behind us for the next generations? We are preparing a better world. And we're actually inviting the young people, okay, to be naked, as you said. <laughs> <laughs> naked in a spiritual sense, naked from a soul and heart sense, okay? We are actually building the future of humanity. We're changing something. Uh, how much more time do I have? Eternity. Hmm? Eternity. Oh, thank you. Eight minutes. Eight minutes, okay. So, those of you in the past that have seen my presentation on transpersonal education, uh, one of the ideas that I have is I want you to imagine that we take uh, school children, okay, on the secondary school, and we divide them into groups of five. In each group, somebody is a uh, very good in a subject. So we got one is good in mathematics, one is good in history, one is good in literature. And we tell them, when you, when you pass an exam, the mark is not individual. The mark will be a collective mark of your group, which means you are responsible for each other. You learn cooperation. You learn to start working in a collective because we cannot do it alone. We need to do it together, we need to support each other. So in a way, let's forget communism to this, put our communist trauma to the side, especially for those of you who are coming from the ex-communist countries, and let's look at it in a different way. Now, regarding communism, in my opinion, because everything that I say is my private opinion, <coughs> subjective opinion. Communism was an excellent idea. 
The problem was that communism did not took the individual emotions it was imposed. So in a way, collectivism and individualism cannot work without each other. We have to learn to combine them. I don't have all the answers. I've got more questions than answers. But for me, the most important thing is to learn to ask the questions.